Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine, and I will be your hostess this evening for Authors Reading Aloud. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our second authors program in this series. We will be running these programs all summer long uh, across every genre of literature you can imagine. And I'm really, really excited about our program this evening. I am joined by Jeffrey Kramer of the Walden Woods Project, and he is going to be reading to us uh, from his book, Solid Seasons, The Friendship of Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, two of my favorite literary figures. I'm very, very excited about this and I'll try not to jump up and down <laughs> like a little girl too much. Um, let me introduce you a bit to Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Kramer is the editor of Walden, a fully annotated edition. Um, this was a winner of a National Outdoor Book Award and a co-winner of the Boston Authors Club's 2005 Julia Ward Howe Special Award. Um, that edition of Walden has been called a handsome all things Walden edition by the Boston Globe US and USA Today said that his side notes in that edition are like short illuminating conversations. Um, he is the author of several other Thorough related texts, author or editor, I should say, including I to Myself, an annotated selection from the Journal of Henry D. Thoreau, um, and the Portable Thoreau collection as well, um, Essays by Henry D. Thoreau, a fully annotated edition, and his Portable em Emerson is another offering as well. Uh, Solid Seasons, the book he'll be sharing with us this evening, uh, was published in 2019 and we're all very excited about it. Um, Jeffrey Kramer has been called <laughs> by Wisconsin Public Radio, uh, a person who lives and breathes thorough. He may know more about the bard at Walden Pond than anyone else alive. So we are so excited to have him with us this evening. Um, Jeffrey, is there anything you want to say about the book before you get started? I don't think so. I'm just I'm excited to be here, part of your program, which I think is just wonderful to be able to bring authors out to people while we're all quarantined. So I love what you're doing. Um, and no, I think I would just jump right into the book. So, okay. For, um, if you, if for, one more thing, um, I did drop a short link uh, that will take you to a page where if you are so motivated this evening, you can purchase a copy of this book or one of Jeffrey's other books from the Walden Woods Project's nonprofit bookshop. And that link will give you all the offerings and it should be in the description of this video. If not, I'll make sure it's there by the end of this evening. All right, Jeffrey, the stage is yours. Welcome, right. thank you. Thank you. Um, so tonight I'd just like to read a few excerpts from the book um, and sort of a little bit at different points in the book. And so I'm going to start off with the actual beginning of the book. Um, it just seems like the best place to start. So I'm going to read a few pages from the beginning. When Ralph Waldo Emerson moved to Concord, Massachusetts in, 18, in 1834, he was 31 years old and boarding with his step-grandfather in the old manse. His first wife had died from tuberculosis. He had traveled to Europe where he met Thomas Carlyle, William Wordsworth, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He had begun to give public lectures. When he moved into his own home, Bush, the following year, he was remarried, financially independent, and about to have his first book, Nature, published. That same year, the 17-year-old Concord-born Henry David Thoreau was attending Harvard College. Stories vary as to how they met and when, but one story Emerson told is this. My first intimacy with Henry began after his graduation in 1837. Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Emerson's sister from Plymouth, then boarded with Mrs. Thoreau and her children in the Parkman House, where the library now stands, and saw the young people every day. She would bring me verses of Henry's, the sick Vita, for instance, which he had thrown into Mrs. Brown's window, tied around with a bunch of violets gathered in his walk, and once a passage out of his journal, which he had read to Sophia Thoreau, who spoke of it to Mrs. Brown as resembling a passage in one of my Concord lectures. Emerson was generous with both time and money, and his assistance to the young Thoreau was no exception. Emerson loaned Thoreau money in May to travel to Maine to look for a teaching position, accompanied by his personal recommendation 
I cordially recommend Mr. Henry D. Thoreau, a graduate of Harvard University in August 1837, to the confidence of such parents or guardians as may propose to employ him as an instructor. I have the highest confidence in Mr. Thoreau's moral character and in his intellectual ability. He is an excellent scholar, a man of energy and kindness, and I shall esteem the town fortunate that secures his services. He also wrote to Josiah Quincy, president of Harvard College, trying to secure some financial aid for Thoreau by attributing his lower academic standing to illness rather than any other cause. Thoreau's interest in Emerson was also increasing. Having borrowed and read Emerson's Nature from the college library twice while attending Harvard, he purchased a copy to give to his classmate, William Allen, calling it in an echo of Robert Burns' epistle to a young friend, neither a song nor a sermon. He sang Emerson's Concord Hymn in the choir at the dedication of the obelisk at Concord's North Bridge in July 1837. And then on August 31st, Emerson delivered the Phi Beta Kappa address to Thoreau's graduating class at Harvard. The American scholar was hailed by Oliver Wendell Holmes as America's intellectual declaration of independence. It spoke of and to man thinking, not an intellectual and academic celebration, but a thinking with the entirety of soul and self-trust culminating in the triad, we will walk on our own feet, we will work with our own hands, we will speak with our own minds. At the time of his graduation, Thoreau was not yet keeping a journal, so his immediate reaction to his Harvard commencement is not known. But when he gave his first public lecture the following spring in Concord, he revisited the memory. One goes to a cattle show expecting to find many men and women assembled and beholds only working oxen and neat cattle. He goes to a commencement thinking that there at least he may find the men of the country, but such, if there are any, are completely merged in the day and it becomes so many walking commencements, so that he is fain to take himself out of sight and hearing of the order, lest he lose his own identity in the non-entities around him. Whether he felt himself losing his identity at his commencement, or whether this was in reaction to or in fear of his falling into the pull of Emerson's orbit, it was something with which Emerson would agree in which he made explicit in his address. I had better never see a book than to be warped by its attraction clean out of my own orbit and made a satellite instead of a system. The one thing in the world of value is the active soul. Friends and followers came to Concord to meet with Emerson, often commenting on Thoreau as an Emerson wannabe. Among those present in July, 1838, was James Russell Lowell briefly suspended from Harvard who found it exquisitely amusing to see how Thoreau imitates Emerson's tone and manner. With my eyes shut, I shouldn't know them apart. A decade later, Lowell was even more stringently satirical in A Fable for Critics, in which he wrote, there comes blank, for instance, to see him's rare sport, tread in Emerson's tracks with legs painfully short, how he jumps, how he strains and gets red in the face to keep step with the mystagogue's natural pace. He falls as close as a stick to a rocket his fingers exploring the prophet's each pocket. Five for shame, brother Bard, with good fruit of your own. Can't you let neighbor Emerson's orchards alone? But Lowell wasn't alone in seeing Thoreau adopting Emersonian characteristics. David Haskins Green, Thoreau's Harvard, Harvard, cap, sorry, Thoreau's Harvard classmate, was quite startled by the transformation that had taken place in him. His short figure and general cast of countenance were, of course, unchanged, but in his manners, in the tones and inflection of his voice, in his modes of expression, even in the hesitations and pauses of his speech, he had become the counterpart of Mr. Emerson. Mr. Thoreau's college voice bore no resemblance to Mr. Emerson's and was so familiar to my ear that I could readily have identified him by it in the dark. I was so much struck with the change and the resemblance in the respect referred to between Mr. Emerson and Mr. Thoreau that I remembered to have taken the opportunity as they sat near together talking of listening to their conversation with closed eyes and to have been unable to determine with certainty which was speaking. It was a notable instance of unconscious imitation. Frank Sanborn, editor, reformer, and journalist, shortly after his move to Concord in 1853, dismissed Thoreau as a sort of pocket edition of Mr. Emerson as far as outward appearances go, in coarser binding with woodcuts instead of the fine steel engravings of Mr. Emerson. He, had, he was a little undersized with a huge Emersonian nose. He dresses very plainly, wears his collar turned over like Mr. Emerson. He talks like Mr. Emerson, so spoils the good things which he says. For what in Mr. Emerson is charming becomes ludicrous and thorough because an imitation. 
And one journalist on hearing this talk on white beans and Walden Pond thought Thoreau might very probably attain to a more respectable rank if he were satisfied to be himself, Henry D. Thoreau, and not aim to be Ralph Waldo Emerson or anybody else. If this was something Emerson himself recognized in the early days of their friendship, I am very familiar with all his thoughts. They are my own quite originally dressed. He soon became exasperated by the comparison which would persist long after Thoreau's death. Emerson defended his friend. I am sure he is entitled to stand quite alone on his proper merits. There might easily have been a little influence from his neighbors on his first writings. He was not quite out of college, I believe, and when I first saw him. But it is long since I, and I think all who knew him, felt that he was the most independent of men in thought and action. Emerson had no patience for the narrow views of Thoreau. Now and then I come across a man that scoffs at Thoreau, he told Pendleton King in 1870, and thinks him affected. For example, Mr. James Russell Lowell is constantly making flings at him. I have tried to show him that Thoreau did things that no one could have done without high powers, but to no purpose. Thoreau's mother also saw resemblance, although with a more maternal reference. How much Mr. Emerson does talk like my Henry. So I want to jump ahead um, to the early 1840s. Um, and their friendship had various ups and downs and, and moments of struggle. Um, but then something happened that really pulled them together. Whatever temporary impasse these friends may have been experiencing, something unexpected brought them a shared and overpowering grief when at the beginning of 1842 saw tragedy strike both the Thoreau and Emerson families. I begin my letter, Lydian wrote her sister, with the strange sad news that John Thoreau has this afternoon left this world. John had cut his left hand thumb while stropping his razor on New Year's Day. Not thinking it serious, he replaced the missing skin and bandaged it. And although within a few days it began to cause him pain, not until January 8th did he actually remove the bandage. The flesh was foul smelling, discolored and darkened. Gangrene had set in. The skin had already begun to mortify when John visited Dr. Josiah Bartlett that Saturday evening. The conquered physician examined and redressed the wound. Although his father, Dr. Josiah Bartlett, another Josiah Bartlett, had written a pamphlet in 1808 on tetanus and the use of amputation as a cure, Bartlett did not find any reason for concern. There were no medical records to explain why he was not alarmed. On his way home, John began to experience pain in various parts of his body. He was barely able to complete the one third mile walk. By morning, his jaw was stiff. Excruciating spasms that evening confirmed the onset of lockjaw. Thoreau was called home from the Emersons where he was living. On Monday, the doctor told John that it was too late for anything to be done and that his death would be quick, but painful. Is there no hope, he asked. The doctor replied simply, none. To which John said, the cup that my father gives me, shall I not drink it? Lydian reported that John retained his senses and some power of speech to the last. He said from the first he knew that he should die, but was perfectly quiet and trustful, saying that God had always been good to him and he could trust him now. His words and behavior throughout were what Mr. Emerson calls manly, even great. Later that day, John took leave of his family, all but his brother. Henry remained when everyone else had left the room. He sat down and talked, as John had asked him to do, without, about nature and poetry. I shall be a good listener, he said, with what strength and humor he can muster, for it is difficult for me to interrupt you. The next day, in his final hour, John looked at his brother <clears throat> with what Thoreau described as a transcendental smile full of heaven, although it was likely the rice's sardonicus caused by muscle spasms. Henry returned a smile. This was the last that passed between them. John died on Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock in his brother's arms. In the evening, Thoreau walked the half mile to Emerson's house to see his friend, but no one else, as Lydian wrote. One does not know, one can only imagine the conversation that took place behind the closed doors of Emerson's study. The death of Thoreau's brother could only have stirred memories of Emerson's own fraternal losses. His brother Edward died in 1834 and more parallel to, John, to Thoreau's loss, Charles in 1836. He had described Charles to Lydian as my noble friend who was my ornament, my wisdom and my pride. How much I saw through his eyes, I feel as if my own were very dim. <clears throat> What was said in the privacy of Emerson's study is not recorded in the journals or correspondence of either man. 
although parts of it may have been conveyed to Lydian, who wrote, <clears throat> he says John took leave of all the family on Monday with perfect calmness and more than resignation. It is a beautiful fate that has been granted him, and I think he was worthy of it. At first, it seemed not beautiful, but terrible. Since I have heard particulars and recollecting all the good I've heard of him, I feel as if a pure spirit has been translated. <clears throat> when Lydian later asked Thoreau <clears throat> if this sudden fate gave any shock to John when he first was aware of his danger, he answered, none at all. It had been John's belief that he would die early. The following morning, Thoreau returned to Bush to get his clothes, unsure when he would return as a member of the Emerson household. Before noon, he was back on Main Street with his family. Lydian loved him for the feeling he showed and the effort he made to be cheerful. He did not give way in the least, but his whole demeanor was that of one struggling with sickness of heart. The sickness of heart with which Thoreau struggled would soon surface in a way that caused considerable alarm to his family and friends. Edward Emerson remembered being told that the shock, loss, and the sight of his brother's terrible suffering at the end for a time overthrew Henry so utterly that he sat still in the house, could do nothing, and his sisters led him out passive to try to help him. Thoreau's depression soon manifested itself physically. On Saturday, January 22nd, Emerson returned to Concord from Boston, where he had delivered the last lecture of his series on the Times, only to find his friend ill and threatened with lockjaw, his brother's disease. It is strange, unaccountable, yet the symptoms seem precise and on the increase. You may judge we are all alarmed, and I not the least, who have the highest hopes of this youth. By Monday, Emerson could write that Thoreau's affection be what it may, is relieved essentially, and what is best, his own feeling of better health established. It was a slow process. I must confess, Thoreau wrote in his journal, there is nothing so strange to me as my own body. I love any piece of nature almost better. A month later, Lydian was writing that Henry is better, nearly well, but his headache or the cause of it made his eyes so weak that he did not read or write much for two days or more. Good health still wasn't totally restored. In March, Thoreau wrote that he had been confined to my chamber for a month with a prolonged shock of the same disorder from close attention to and sympathy with him, which I learned is not without precedent. A year later, on the anniversary of John's death, Thoreau asked in his journal, what am I at present? He answered, a diseased bundle of nerves standing between time and eternity like a withered leaf that still hangs shivering on its stem. The relief Emerson experienced over his friend's returning health that January was brief. <clears throat> Waldo, Emerson's five-year-old son, showed signs of scarlet fever. It began with a soreness of throat and a fever. Eruptions on the skin appeared similar to measles but occurring more rapidly, yet following the eruptions of the fever did not begin to subside as with measles. Baldo's skin took on a broad patches of the vivid red color that gave the disease its name. Seizures were followed by delirium. <clears throat> a sweet and wonderful boy, Emerson wrote Carlyle, was hurried out of my arms in three short days by Scarlatina. When Alcott sent his daughter, the nine-year-old Louisa, to ask after Waldo's health, it would be one of her earliest remembrances of Emerson and one she would not forget. He came to the door looking so worn with watching and changed by sorrow that I was startled and could only stammer out my message. He simply answered, child, he is dead, and closed the door. Louisa ran home to tell her family the news. She later recollected that it was my first glimpse of a great grief, but I never have forgotten the anguish that made a familiar face so tragical and gave those few words more pathos than the sweet lamentation of Emerson's poetic requiem for his son, Threnody. For a period following Waldo's death, Emerson saw the world only in relation to his son. What he looked upon is better, he wrote on January 30th. What he looked not upon is insignificant. On waking, he found that the sun had risen as usual with all his light, but the landscape was dishonored by this loss. For this boy, in whose remembrance I have both slept and awaked so oft, decorated for me the morning star, the evening cloud, how much more all the particulars of daily economy. Until this time, Emerson had relied on his intellect to carry him through a crisis. Even the death of his first wife, Ellen, and his brother Charles had not brought him to this place. The pretense, based on his previous experiences of death, was shaken. He had once confessed, if my wife, my child, my mother should be taken from me, I should still remain whole with the same capacity of cheap enjoyment from all things. I should not grieve enough, although I love them. Now, however, 
he admitted simply to his journal, the wisest know nothing. The ideas expressed in his essay, Compensation, the death of a dear friend, wife, brother, lover, which seemed nothing but privation, somewhat later assumes the aspect of a guide or genius, for it is commonly operates revolutions in our way of life, terminates an epoch of infancy or of youth, which was waiting to be closed, breaks up a wanted occupation or a household or a style of living and allows the formation of new ones more friendly to the growth of character. It did little to assuage the pain he was currently feeling. In an undated and later, and later canceled journal entry from 1843, Emerson wrote down Lydian's wish that she had never been born, followed by her statement with which he must have been in agreement. I do not see how God can compensate me for the sorrow of existence. He could not anticipate a return to the comfort expressed in his poem, Give All to Love, in which he wrote, when half gods go, the gods arrive. In an effort to capture what he had lost, Emerson began to collect little bits of Waldo's conversations in his journal. It was his way of dealing with the dead and the dying, and he would later do it again when Margaret Fuller drowned and when Thoreau was dying. He remembered the fanciful names Waldo gave to the parts of a toy house he was always building, such as the Interspeglium and the Corridaga. Once when Waldo asked if there were other countries besides the United States, and his father began to name them, Thoreau commented on the boy's way, large way of speech that offered questions that did not admit of an answer. They were the same which you would ask yourself. When it happened to thunder while Waldo was blowing his whistle, he said that his, that his music makes the thunder dance. And one time he asked Lydian, Mama, may I have this bell which I have been making to stand by the side of my bed? Yes, his mother answered, it may stand there. But Mama Waldo suggested, I'm afraid it will alarm you. It may sound in the middle of the night and it'll be heard all over the town. It will be louder than 10,000 hawks. It'll be heard across the river in all the countries. It'll be heard all over the world. It will be sound like some great glass thing which falls down and breaks all to pieces. The following month, Emerson wrote to his childless friend, Carlisle, you can never sympathize with me. You can never know how much of me such a young child can take away. Although Emerson wrote in experience that grief too will make us idealists, in the death of my own son, now more than two years ago, I seem to have lost a beautiful estate. No more, I cannot get it nearer to me. Margaret Fuller saw a loneliness that remained. Two years after, Emerson's, uh, after Waldo's death, she wrote Emerson, I know you are not a marker of days, nor do in any way encourage those useless pains which waste the strength needed for our nobler purposes. Yet it seems to me this season can never pass without opening anew the deep wound. I miss him when I go to your home. I miss him when I think of you there. You seem to me lonely as if he filled you to a place which no other ever could in any degree. She exhibited an understanding and perspective rare for the mid 19th century. She recognized that little Edith has been injured in my affections by being compared with him. I do not like to have her put in his place or likened to him. It only makes me feel that she is not the same and do her injustice. Even more to the point, she told her friend, I hope you will have another son, for I perceive that men do not feel themselves represented to the next generation by daughters. But I hope if you do, there will be no comparisons made. Emerson's reply reflected none of Fuller's concern for his other children living or yet to be born. Instead, he wrote of his still present pain, telling Fuller that when Lydian said, it is two years today, I only heard the bell stroke again. I have had no experience, no progress to put me into better intelligence with my calamity than when it was new. When Emerson's house burned 30 years later, friends and neighbors worked hurriedly to save what they could. Emerson collected together the letters of his first wife, Ellen, along with Waldo's clothes that he had kept. He was not making a desperate effort to save those relics of the lost loved ones. It was the opposite. His daughter described how her father gathered those personal objects and then deliberately threw them into the fire. With those gestures, Emerson threw the last vestiges of Ellen and Waldo into the burning bush. <clears throat> As I'm reading this, I'm realizing that there's a lot of depressing stuff in here. So um, yeah, um, no good humorous parts coming yet. So we're gonna jump ahead a little bit um, and read about civil disobedience. Um, something that is just such a relevant topic these days and so important to think about. 
It matters not how small the beginning may seem to be, Thoreau wrote in Civil Disobedience. His move to Walden Pond on July 4th, 1845 was just such a small beginning. His noting of the event was inauspicious. Yesterday I came here to live, he wrote in his journal the next day. That he moved on the anniversary of American independence has been touted as Thoreau's own day of independence, which may be little more than an academic mythologizing. A more personal reason may have prompted his timing and his claim that it's falling on Independence Day was an accident is more truth than literary device. Thoreau went to Walden Pond to write a book commemorating his brother. By moving in on the 4th of July, he would awaken to see the sun rise on his new life at the pond in the morning, on the morning of what would have been John's 30th birthday. Walden Woods was marginal land, not arable, it was good only for woodlots. The land on which Thoreau built his house was one of Emerson's lots, and he was able to live on his friend's land in exchange for the same type of labor and help he gave when living in the Emerson household. <clears throat> the woods were also home to people who, in their own way, were marginal to conquered society. The Irish building the railroad, the formerly enslaved, alcoholics, those simply called lurkers, and now Henry David Thoreau. It was no wonder people made very particular inquiries concerning his life there. When people asked him what he was doing there, he presented a lecture, a history of myself, before the Concord Lyceum, and this book became the foundation for Walden. Thoreau woke with the sun, and his days might include a morning bath in the pond, a period for reading and writing, hoeing his bean field, and a long walk through the woods, botanizing and observing, a second bath or afternoon swim. <clears throat> he might row out on the pond or the river playing his flute, visit friends and family in Concord, or receive visitors at his house by the pond, take a night walk, and occasionally answer the call of Emerson. During his first winter at the pond out from under Emerson's roof, Thoreau began writing brief assessments of Emerson in his journal, <clears throat> such as Emerson does not consider things in respect to their essential utility, but an important partial and relative one as works of art, perhaps. His prose pass one side of their center of gravity. His exaggeration is of a part, not of the whole. In a year's time, Thoreau completed a draft of his first book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, which Emerson had already been touting as a seven days voyage in as many chapters, pastoral as Isaac Walton, spicy as flag root, broad and deep as menu. Emerson admired what the two Thoreau brothers had done. They were not an example of those students of words Emerson criticized in New England reformers who are shut up in schools and colleges and recitation rooms for 10 or 15 years and come out at last with a bag of wind, a memory of words and do not know a thing. We cannot use our hands or our legs or our eyes or our arms. We do not know an edible root in the woods. We cannot tell our course by the stars nor the hour of the day by the sun. <clears throat> it is well if we can swim and skate. We are afraid of a horse, of a cow, of a dog, of a snake, of a spider. But he saw in the Thoreau brothers too who would read God directly. Experience Emerson wrote his hands and feet to the very enterprise. As he said in the American scholar, so much only of life as I know by experience, so much of the wilderness have I vanquished and planted, or so far have I extended my being, my dominion. I do not see how any man can afford to spare any action in which he can partake. Thoreau believed in the benefits of old shoes. New shoes were commonly too narrow, but an old shoe that had formed to the idiosyncrasies of your foot, that was synonymous with comfort. As he noted in his journal, King James loved his old shoes best. Who does not? After visiting the cobbler in Concord in July of 1846, Thoreau was met by Sam Staples. Edward Emerson described Staples as one who rose through the grades of bartender, clerk, constable, and jailer, deputy sheriff, representative to the general court, auctioneer, real estate agent, and gentleman farmer to be one of the most valued, valued and respected fathers of the village family. Staples was finishing his term as the tax collector that year. Since he needed tonight to either collect any outstanding taxes or as a consequence for his failure to do so, pay them himself, he attempted to collect from Thoreau. <clears throat> Thoreau refused on principle. Neither a volunteerist nor a no government man it was a matter of personal protest in which he refused to pay a tax to a government that allowed for slavery. So Staples arrested him. <clears throat> Thoreau was introduced to his cellmate. Hugh Connell was an Irishman a few years younger than Thoreau. He was accused of burning Israel Hunt's barn in the neighboring town of Sudbury and was awaiting trial. As near as I could discover, Thoreau wrote in civil disobedience, 
he had probably gone to bed in a barn when drunk and smoked his pipe there, and so a barn was burnt. Thoreau's sympathy may have partly stemmed from his own accidental burning of hundreds of acres of woodland two years before, for which he escaped any fine or imprisonment, and only occasionally suffered hearing the words burnt woods whispered behind his back. Connell, however, poor and foreign, lacking the friends and standing that Thoreau enjoyed, did not get off as lightly. <clears throat> Staples left, the door was locked. Connell showed Thoreau where to hang his hat and how he managed his matters there. While well, Thoreau pumped my fellow prisoner as dry as I could for fear I should never see him again. Word traveled. Soon someone came and paid, them, paid Thoreau's tax to Sam Staples' daughter, Ellen, while her father was out. Although Thoreau should have been released, Staples had already re removed his boots by the time Ellen told him about the paid debt, and he decided to let his prisoner remain in jail for the night. Breakfast came, a pint of chocolate with brown bread. Thoreau ate what he could, leaving some bread, which Connell seized with instructions that he should save it up for lunch or dinner. When Connell was led out to work at haying in a neighboring field, that was the last Thoreau saw of him. It is unlikely he knew that Connell soon served five years in prison for arson. Although Thoreau was angry at the intervention of his anonymous taxpayer and Staples' insistence that he leave the jail, he and his jailer were always good friends, Emerson Edward, em, Edward Emerson wrote. The next day, Alcott and Emerson had a long discussion about the incarceration. Alcott wrote in his journal about his earnest talk with Emerson dealing with civil powers and institutions arising from Thoreau's going to jail for refusing to pay his tax. Alcott said that Emerson thought it mean and skulking and in bad taste, a summation that has unfairly stuck to Emerson. He wrote page after page in his journal of arguments, both for and against Alcott's position and what presumably was Thoreau's. In one passage, Emerson showed a complete understanding and ultimately a sense of pride in his friend's stand. He wrote, these rabble at Washington are really better than the sniveling opposition. They have a sort of genius of a hold and manly caste, though satanic. They see against the unanimous expression of the people, how much of a little well-directed effrontery can achieve, how much crime the people will bear, and they proceed from step to step, and it seems they have calculated but too justly upon your excellency, O Governor Briggs. Mr. Webster told them how much the war cost, that was his protest, but voted for the war and sends his son to it. They calculated rightly on Mr. Webster. <clears throat> My friend Thoreau has gone to jail rather than pay his tax. On him, they could not calculate. The abolitionists denounced the war and give much time to it, but they pay the tax. Don't run amuck against the world, Emerson wrote, briefly considering the position that if the state means you well, if 90 parts of, the, of what it does is for good and 10 parts for mischief, then you cannot fight hardly for a fraction. The falsity of this justification was apparent as he continued. The abolitionists, he said, ought to resist and go to prison in multitudes on their known and described disagreements from the state. I should heartily applaud them. Ultimately, Emerson took issue with those abolitionists who spoke for freeing the enslaved, but were not willing to give up a lifestyle that directly supported the institutions they condemned, cotton, rum, shipping. In the particular, he wrote, it is worth considering that refusing payment of the state tax does not reach the evil so nearly as many other methods within your reach. It was your coat, your sugar, that kept people in chains. Yet these, and he must have seen he was criticizing himself in this as well, you do not stick at buying. In another entry he wrote, your objection then to the state of Massachusetts is deceptive. Your true quarrel is with the state of man. And so I just wanna jump ahead even further. Um, and this seems to be a night for reading about death, but I really want to um, talk about Thoreau's death a little bit <clears throat> and its effect on Emerson. So um, please bear with me. The winter of 1860 was cold, wet, and snowy. Many people were ill, including Alcott, from whom Thoreau caught a cold when they were planning John Brown's memorial service. I took a severe cold about the 3rd of December, Thoreau wrote in February 1861, which at length resulted in a kind of bronchitis, so that I have been confined to the house ever since, accepting a few experimental trips as far as the post office in some particular mild noons. Thoreau's journal, often a barometer of his physical health, is blank from the 4th until the 22nd. Bronchitis, or chronic bronchitis, is a euphemism used for tuberculosis, and Ellery Channing was clear about the consumptive nature of Thoreau's illness. He is reduced much in stature. Channing, who had begun reading medical texts and making a study of Thoreau's condition, reported in April that 
Henry's bronchitis is very obstinate. It does not perceptibly mend. It is understood that the physician advises a warmer climate. I have still confidence that Henry may recover from this very obstinate attack, knowing how perfectly obstinate he is also. Henry has lost much flesh. All air and all harsh affects him very much. He is also, I judge, far from strong as he had on Sunday morning last, a fainting time. I say, I think he will recover, but he is a singular constitution and acts by himself. But if you were sick as he, I should not set your life at a pin's fee. In May, Emerson dined with Thoreau and Horace Mann Jr., who were planning a trip to Minnesota for Thoreau's health. The next day, Emerson provided Thoreau with a little list of names of good men who you may chance to see in case the travelers needed assistance of any sort. I'm still as much an invalid as when you and Theophilus Brown were here, Thoreau H. Geo Blake, before he left in mid mid May, if not more of one. And at this rate, there is danger that the cold weather may come again before I get over my bronchitis. The doctor accordingly tells me that I must clear out to the West Indies or elsewhere. He does not seem to care much where, but I decide against the West Indies on account of their muggy heat in the summer and the south of Europe on account of the expense of time and money and have at last concluded that it will be most expedient for me to try the air of Minnesota, some, somewhere about St. Paul. I am only waiting to be well enough to start, hope to get off within a week or 10 days. The excursion did little for Thoreau's health. Robert Collier, who Thoreau visited in Chicago, wrote that he would pause with a pathetic patience to master the trouble in his chest. In July, Thoreau returned home to Concord from Minnesota, and it was clear to him, as it was to everyone else, that whatever time was left in him was limited. On seeing him shortly after his return, Daniel Moncure Conway said Thoreau was sadly out of health, and Simon Brown had no doubt, but he's in the first stage of consumption. In a quietly prophetic passage, Thoreau wrote Daniel Rickardson, if I do not mend very quickly, I shall be obliged to go to another climate again very soon. He left the house infrequently. Special events would draw him out, a final visit in August to Daniel Rickardson in New Bedford, a send-off dinner also in August for Edward Emerson heading off to Harvard, and occasional visits with friends. Recalling Thoreau's joy over his music box nearly 20 years earlier, the Hawthorns loaned him their own music box to soothe him during his final days. In September, Channing was writing with a significant underscoring, he is no better. He had not the least faith in Josiah Bartlett, the man who misdiagnosed the severity of John's cut as Thoreau's physician, even though Thoreau has and concludes to follow him. The doctor says there's nothing the matter with Henry's lungs, but that it is all in his throat. I think he has made up his mind to sink or swim under the vi village Asclepius. For a while into autumn, too weak to walk, Thoreau would take a ride in a wagon every other day or so courtesy of his neighbor, Ebenezer Rockwood Hoare. His journal over the almost daily repository, his journal, once the almost daily repository for his thoughts, contains fewer than a dozen entries after his July return home, the final entry written in, in early November. At the first of the new year, Alcott noted that it was sad to find him failing and feeble, but the most he may hope for is to prepare his manuscripts for others' editing and take his leave of them and us. Channing found Thoreau greatly dec decreased, if it was possible, in flesh. I do not think he weighs today but a very little, and a few days since, his pulse was at 56. Emerson felt ever threatened by the decay of Henry Thoreau, writing, as we live longer, it looks as if our company were picked out to die first, and we live on in a lessening minority. Preparing for the inevitable task of writing a eulogy, Emerson began to gather thoughts and memories about his friend. Despite, despite his weakening, Thoreau always tried to participate in conversations. When Emerson told him about things happening beyond his window view, such as walking across Walden Pond on the ice on the 1st of April, Thoreau told him he had known the ice to hold as late as April 18th. When Emerson reported of a purple fin she'd heard, Thoreau recalled hearing a blue snowbird on Monadnock. Thoreau tells me Emerson wrote in his journal that chickadees are very sociable with woodchoppers and will take crumbs from their hands. Sam Staples told Emerson he had never spent an hour with more satisfaction, never saw a man dying with so much pleasure and peace. Thinks that the very few men in Concord know Mr. Thoreau, finds him serene and happy. Emerson then recalled something Thoreau had said to him, something that could have been a summing up of their friendship. Henry praised to me lately the manners of an old, established, calm, well-behaved river as perfectly distinguished from those of a new river. A new river is a torrent an old one slow, 
and steadily supplied. What happens in any part of the old river relates to what befalls in every other part of it. It is full of compensations, resources, and reserved funds. <clears throat> Thoreau died on the morning of May 8th, 1862. <clears throat> His sister Sophia wrote that she could never be grateful enough for the gentle, easy exit, exit which he was granted. At seven o'clock Tuesday morning, he became restless and desired to be moved. A little after eight, he asked himself to be raised quite up. His breathing grew fainter and fainter. And with the slightest, without the slightest struggle, he left us at nine o'clock. <clears throat> May 9, the day of Thoreau's funeral, was clear and calm. The service was held at the First Parish Church, a thing Henry would not have liked, Louisa Malcott wrote. But Emerson said his sorrow was so great, he wanted all the world to mourn with him. <clears throat> there were those who said that Thoreau was an infidel and who should not be buried from the church as he did not attend it in life. But she knew that, <clears throat> excuse me, let's try again. <clears throat> but she knew that if ever a man was a real Christian, it was Henry. And I think his own wise and pious thoughts read by one who loved him, Bronson Alcott, and his own life was a beautiful example of religious faith, convinced many and touched the hearts of all. Sophia felt that her brother was honored by such a public funeral from the church. The death of friends Thur wrote should inspire us as much as their lives. Emerson may have hoped that his eulogy, written out of a profound grief, would achieve what he said Thoreau's did for John Brown, when his earnest eulogy of the hero was heard by all respectfully, by many with a sympathy that surprised themselves. For the most part, he succeeded, wanting to show his neighbors the Thoreau he knew and loved. Emerson Julie was delivered with a broken, tender voice. Sophia described it as an address as no other man could have done. It is the source of great satisfaction that one so gifted knew and loved my brother and is prepared to speak such brave words about him at this time. Annie Fields, wife of the publisher James T. Fields, thought his address made the simple ceremony one never to be forgotten. And Louisa May Alcott thought it was good in itself, but not appropriate to the time or place. Gathering journal passages about Thoreau written over the vast expanse of their friendship, covering the best moments and the worst, reiterating his own hopes and disappointments, Emerson offered a full portrait his loss did not allow him to gloss over the less agreeable aspects of Thoreau's personality and disposition that he experienced. Had the eulogy stayed in Concord, it may not have mattered, but publishing it in the Atlantic Monthly brought it to the world, cementing a, a portrait of Thoreau that even in our day is difficult to shake. Out of the entirety of Emerson's thoughtful and expansive eulogy, full of love, praise, and unbounded admiration, posterity has repeatedly quoted this as Emerson's summation. I cannot help counting it as a fault in him that he had no ambition, wanting this instead of engineering for all America, he was the captain of a huckleberry party. But in the very next paragraph, Emerson was unsure if these foibles he saw were real or apparent and continued on to recognize his best friend, the best in his friend till he reached his true summation. The country knows not yet, he said, or in the least part how great a son it has lost. It seems an injury that he should leave in the midst of his broken task, which none else can finish, a kind of indignity um, to so noble a soul that he should depart out of nature before yet he has been really shown to his peers for what he is. His soul was made for the noblest society. He had in a short life exhausted the capabilities of this world. Wherever there is knowledge, wherever there is virtue, wherever there is beauty, he will find a home. Truth was always the cornerstone of whatever Emerson wrote, and this was no exception. Emerson learned later that people were dissatisfied with my notice of him in the Atlantic after his death. They did not want me to place any bounds to his genius. But he was paying the highest honor to his friend by acknowledging in an honest portrait something Thoreau said in his first book. The rarest quality in an epitaph is truth. And I just want to read one very, 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 very short thing. Um, and this this very short um, anecdote or story is really what compelled me to write this book. Um, I was giving a, I was on a panel once and I said this little story out loud and, and the audience just became hushed and I realized how the power of it. So um, this has been used in, um, sadly, in, in every PR bit about this book. So it's like everywhere. And so if you've read anything about this book, you've probably already heard this, but I do want to just close with this brief bit. In October of 1878, 
Anne Burroughs Gilchrist, the English writer and friend of Walt Whitman, visited Concord for a brief period, spending two evenings in the company of the 75-year-old Emerson and his family. She wrote that his memory fails somewhat as to recent names and topics, but as is usual in such cases, all the mental impressions that were made when he was in full vigor remain clear and strong. As they chatted, Emerson called to Lydian in the next room. What was the name of my best friend? Henry Thoreau, she answered. Oh yes, Emerson repeated, Henry Thoreau. Thank you so much for that, Jeffrey. That was wonderful. Um, I know it's very difficult as an author to read under these circumstances, having no idea if anyone is watching you, if anyone is connecting with your words. Um, so I just wanted, first of all, to thank you for being so brave to do that. And secondly, to reassure you that yes, you have an audience and they're listening and they've loved every word. That you thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share a couple comments that I will try not to cry because I'm over emotional. <laughs> um, Lorraine Martin wrote, what an absolute treat this is to be listening to Jeff read his own work and to hear about these two great men's friendship. And here's another one that is just so special uh, from Sandy Hemmel. Um, Wonderful book, enhanced by the richness of the spoken word. My 18 month old granddaughter sits here with me, listening with rapt attention. <laughs> so just to give, just, I hope that that helps to uh, settle some of the nervousness of, of doing a program like this where we can't, we can't feel that immediate energy with our audience. Um, does anybody, I'm gonna to try to get through the comments here. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Jeffrey uh, about uh, what he shared with us, um, please let me know. I'm gonna be, let me scan through these real quickly. Uh, we've had uh, people tuning in from Canada, Missouri, New York City, Chicago, uh, McHenry, Maryland, yes, <laughs> me. Uh, here in Harper's Ferry, uh, Western Pennsylvania. Yes, thank you. More people from Canada. Um, of course, Concord. <laughs> I would imagine a few. <laughs> <laughs> a few. Oregon. Um, yes, I, I think one of the things that's that I hope with these programs, I hope that we can do is bring that that sense of community that that gathers around books and storytelling. Um, <laughs> comment about your uh, your depressing stories. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't apologize. The comment is they're not depressing. They are moving, and and people connect with those emotions. So thank you. Um, okay. All right. So I guess a couple questions here. Um, We talked, you, you were explaining some of the process of, of mourning that Emerson was experiencing mm -hmm. and, and Thoreau as well with his, the loss of his brother. Um, do you feel that there, for some reason, I have, I have been involved in a lot of conversations about mourning lately in the 19th <laughs> century. Uh, I guess that's just my world at the moment. Um, do you feel that, that what these men are exhibiting uh, in their journals and conversations, is that is that a typical of of mourning practices for men at that time? We tend to hear more about women exhibiting mm -hmm. uh, the physical, material, culture aspects of mourning. Um, can you speak? Is this typical? Were they were they not typical? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Thoreau's was more typical. He kept a lot of it inside, which is why it it showed itself in um, sympathetic lockjaw and why it took him about a year to become healthy again. Mm -hmm. um, he couldn't quite express his grief, which is why he went to Walden Pond to write A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers about his brother, John. Um, and so even like later in life, if people mentioned John's name in passing, tears would literally well up in his eyes. Um, Emerson 
did the opposite thing. The moment Walder died, he was expressing his grief. And he was literally writing letters to everyone he knew to talk about Waldo's death. And he would talk about it and he would write about it. And his journal was filled with it. And as I said, he was writing down things that Waldo said so he wouldn't forget them. Um, and so he had a way of sort of letting that grief out. And it never, not to say it goes away, but Emerson had a way of finally dealing with it um, because he could express it so clearly. Um, and I think Thoreau could never do that. And so I th actually think Thoreau's way of dealing with it was more the accepted way that men dealt with, with mourning in those days by being manly and keeping it in. Mm. Let's see here. Um, here's a question. Oh, do you know the location where Henry and Emerson first met? I don't. I mean, because no one know, no one knows. There are different stories about how they met and where they met, and some of them don't quite even make sense. Um, and there's some actually examination that Thoreau, um, that, sorry, that Emerson was an overseer for um, before Thoreau entered Harvard. So they would have known each other, um, you know, a little bit um, prior to their actual meeting. But the actual meeting is, is unclear um, how or when. Um, I would guess it would be at Emerson's house, but there's really no record of when it actually happened. Uh, if Emerson called Thoreau his best friend, would Thoreau have thought the same of him, excluding his brother John? Excluding his brother John, yeah. Um, I think both of them were looking for a best friend. Um, Thoreau's approach to friendship was one at a time. Um, and so it was John, and when John died, he moved on, and it was Emerson. Um, and he put basically all his eggs in one basket. Thur Emerson was a little different than that. Um, although he thought of Thoreau as his best friend, he got different things from different friends. So um, he didn't put everything onto Thoreau as, as Thoreau did, which is why I think Thoreau was more disappointed in Emerson than Emerson ever was in Thoreau. Um, but I think if, em if Thoreau could have heard Emerson call him that, um, he would have loved that. Um, and and vice versa, I think in you know the other way around would also um, have been just a wonderful thing for for them. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Well, I think this looks like a point to bring this to a close. Okay. I mean, um, Jeff, do you have anything to share? But any any last words before we say goodbye? I don't, other than I want to thank you for hosting this and, and setting up this great series um, so that authors could talk to people and read their works. Um, and I just, I just think that in what we're all going through right now, both politically in this country, but as well as um, with, with COVID and, and health and quarantining, um, the idea of friendship, um, who we can love, who we can trust, who we want to be with um, at these moments is such an important thing. So, um, you know, you, you, both Emerson and Thoreau search deeply to find um, the friend, the friend, I mean, capital letters all the way through it, um, which was idealistic and no one ever finds that friend, I don't think, um, sadly, but um, I think th these are the times now in these moments of crisis that um, that is when we wanna find that person or those people that are near and dear to us and, and hold on to them and cherish them. Really powerful words and, and excellent advice for this time and, and always thank you for that. Thank you, Catherine. Um, well, everyone, I, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with Jeffrey and myself exploring this beautiful book. Uh, the link again should be in the video description, but I'll make sure it's there. <laughs> if it's not, as soon as we, we, we end this video. Um, as I said at the beginning, this series is going on all summer long. We have at least one program every week. We'll be back on Sunday with a return to my town of Harper's Ferry. Author Eugene Meyer will be sharing his story, um, Five for Freedom, about the African-American soldiers in John Brown's army. So if there are members of the Thoreau Society watching this, this evening um, and you're familiar with the annual gathering, I was actually going to come visit you this summer and, and share some of those stories with you in a presentation. So you can get a little sneak peek of that, which hopefully we'll get to talk about someday with Eugene's book on Sunday at seven. 
Um, thank you again for joining us tonight and uh, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>